Michel de Montaigne on Drunkenness The world is all variation and dissimilarity. Vices are all the same in that they are vices, and doubtless the Stoics understand matters after that fashion. But even though they are all equally vices, they are not equal vices. That a man who has overstepped by a hundred yards those limits should not be in a worse condition than a man who has only overstepped them by ten yards is not believable. Nor that sacrilege should be no worse than stealing a cabbage from our garden. There is as much diversity in vice as in anything else. It is dangerous to confound the rank and importance of sins. Murderers, traitors, and tyrants gain too much by it. It is not reasonable that they should be able to salve their consciences because somebody else is lazy, lascivious, or not assiduous in his prayers. Each man comes down heavily on his neighbor's sins and lessens the weight of his own. Even the doctors of the church often rank sins badly to my taste. Just as Socrates said, the prime duty of wisdom is to distinguish good from evil. We, whose best always partakes of vice, should say the same about knowing how to distinguish between the vices. If that is not done exactingly, the virtuous man and the vicious man will be jumbled unrecognizably together. Now drunkenness, considered among other vices, has always seemed to me gross and brutish. In others our minds play a larger part, and there are some vices which have something or other magnanimous about them, if that is the right word. There are some which are intermingled with learning, diligence, valor, prudence, skill, and finesse. Drunkenness is all body and earthy. Moreover, the grossest nation of our day is alone in honoring it. Other vices harm our intellect. This one overthrows it, and it stuns the body. The worst state for a man is when he loses all consciousness and control of himself. And among other things they say that, just as the must fermenting in the wine jar stirs up all the lees at the bottom, so too does wine unbung the most intimate secrets of those who have drunk beyond measure. Josephus tells how he wheedled secrets out of an ambassador sent to him by his enemies by making him drink a lot. Nevertheless, Augustus confided his most private secrets to Lucius Piso, the conqueror of Thrace, and was never let down. Nor was Tiberius let down by Cosus, on whom he unburdened all of his plans. Yet we know that those two men were so given to drinking that they had often to be carried out of the Senate, both drunk. And the plan to kill Caesar was well kept when confided to Cassius, who drank water, but also when confided to Cimber, who often got drunk, which explains his joking reply, Should I bear the weight of a tyrant when I cannot bear the weight of my wine? Even our German mercenaries, when drowned in their wine, remember where they are quartered, the password, and their rank. I would never have thought anybody could be 
buried so insensibly in drunkenness if I had not read the following in the history books. With the purpose of inflicting on him some notable indignity, Attalus invited to supper that Pausanias who, on this very subject, later killed Philip, king of Macedonia, a king whose fine qualities nevertheless bore witness to the education he had received in the household and company of Epaminondas. He got him to drink so much that he could bring him, quite unaware of what he was doing, to abandon his fair body to mule drivers and to many of the most abject scullions in this establishment, as if it were the body of some whore in a hedgerow. And then there is the case told me by a lady whom I honor and hold in the greatest esteem. Towards Castres, near Bordeaux, where her house is, there was a village woman, a widow of chaste reputation, who, becoming aware of the first hints that she might be pregnant, told the women of the neighborhood that if only she had a husband, she would think she was expecting. But as the reason for her suspicions grew bigger every day and finally became evident, she was reduced to having a declaration made from the pulpit in the parish church, stating that if any man would admit what he had done, she promised to forgive him and, if he so wished, to marry him. One of her young farm laborers took courage at this proclamation and stated that he had found her one feast day by her fireside after she had drunk her wine freely. She was so deeply and provocatively asleep that he had been able to have her without waking her up. They married each other and are still alive. Antiquity, certainly, did not greatly condemn this vice. The very writings of several philosophers speak of it indulgently. Even among the Stoics there are those who advise you to let yourself drink as much as you like occasionally, and to get drunk so as to relax your very soul. That censor and corrector of others, Cato, was reproached for his heavy drinking. Such a famous king as Cyrus cited among the praiseworthy qualities which made him preferable to his brother Artaxerxes the fact that he knew how to drink better. Even among the best regulated and best governed peoples, it was very common to assay men by making them drunk. I have heard one of the best doctors in Paris, Silvius, state that it is a good thing once a month to arouse our stomachs by this excess, so as to stop their powers from getting sluggish and to stimulate them in order to prevent their growing dull. And we can read that the Persians discussed their most important affairs only after drinking wine. My taste and my complexion are more hostile than my reason to this vice. For, leaving aside the fact that I readily allow my beliefs to be captive to the ancients, I find this vice base and stultifying, but less wicked and a cause of less harm than the others, which virtually all do more direct public damage to our society. And if, as they maintain, we can never enjoy ourselves without it costing us something. I find that this vice costs our conscience less than the others. Besides, it is not a negligible consideration that it is easy to provide for and easy to find. A man advanced in years and rank told me that he counted drink among the three main pleasures left to him in his life. But he set about it in the wrong way. For fine palates and an anxious selecting of wine are to be absolutely avoided. 
If you base your pleasure on drinking good wine, you are bound to suffer from sometimes drinking bad. Your taste ought to be more lowly and more free. To be a good drinker, you must not have too tender a palate. The Germans enjoy drinking virtually any wine. Their aim is to gulp it rather than to taste it. They get a better bargain. Their pleasure is more abundant and closer at hand. Secondly, to drink in the French style at both meals, but moderately for fear of your health, is too great a restraint on the indulgence of God Bacchus. More time and constancy are required. The ancients spent entire nights in this occupation, and often went on into the next day. So we should train our habit in wider, firmer ways. I have seen in my time a great lord, a person famous for his success in several expeditions of high importance, who effortlessly and in the course of his ordinary meals never drank less than two gallons of wine, and who, after that, never showed himself other than most sage and well-advised in the conduct of our affairs. We should allow more time to that pleasure which we wish to count on over the whole of our lives. Like shop apprentices and workmen, we ought to refuse no opportunity for a drink. We ought always to have the desire for one in our heads. It seems that we are cutting down this particular one all the time, and that as I saw a boy, dinner parties, suppers, and late-night feasts used to be much more frequent and common in our houses than they are now. Could we really be moving towards an improvement in something at least? Certainly not. It is because we throw ourselves into lechery much more than our fathers did. Those two occupations impede each other's strength. On the one hand, lechery has weakened our stomachs. On the other, sober drinking has rendered us vigorous and lively in our lovemaking. It is wonderful what accounts I heard my father give of the chastity of his times. He had the right to say so, as he was both my art and nature most graceful in the company of ladies. He talked little and well. He intermingled his speech with elegant references to books in the vernacular, especially Spanish and among the Spanish he frequently cited the so-called Marco Aurelio. His face bore an expression of gentle seriousness, humble and very modest. He took particular care to be respectable and decent in his person and his dress, both on horse and on foot. He was enormously faithful to his word and, in all things conscientious and meticulous, tending rather towards over-scrupulousness. For a small man, he was very strong, straight and well-proportioned. His face was pleasing and rather brown. He was skilled and punctilious in all gentlemanly sports. I have also seen some canes filled with lead, with which he is said to have exercised his arms for throwing the bar and the stone or for fencing, as well as shoes shod with lead to improve his running and jumping. Folk recall little miracles of his at the long jump. When he was over sixty, I remember him laughing at our own agility by vaulting into the saddle in his furry gown, by putting his weight on his thumb and leaping over a table, and by never going up to his room without jumping three or four steps at a time. But, more to my subject, he said that there was hardly one woman of quality in the whole province who was ill-spoken of, 
and he would tell of men, especially himself, who were on remarkably intimate terms with decent women, without a breath of suspicion. In his own case, he solemnly swore that he came virgin to his marriage bed, and yet he had long done his bit in the Transalpine Wars, leaving a detailed diary of events there, both public and personal. And he married on his return from Italy in 1528, at the mature age of thirty-three. Let us get back to our bottles. The disadvantages of old age, which has need of support and renewal, could reasonably give birth to a desire for drink, since a capacity for wine is virtually the last pleasure which the passing years steal from us. According to our drinking fraternity, natural heat first gets a hold on our feet. That concerns our childhood. From there it rises to our loins, where it long settles in, producing there, if you ask me, the only true bodily pleasures of this life. In comparison, the other pleasures are half asleep. Finally, like a mist rising and evaporating, it lands in the gullet and makes there its last abode. For all that, I do not understand how anyone can prolong the pleasure of drinking beyond his thirst, forging in his mind an artificial appetite which is contrary to nature. My stomach would never get that far. It has enough bother dealing with what it takes in for its needs. I am so constituted that I care little for drink except at dessert. That is why my last draught is usually my biggest. Anacharsis was amazed that the Greeks should drink out of bigger glasses at the end of their meals. It was, I think, for the same reason that the Germans do. That is when they start their drinking contests. Plato forbids young people to drink before the age of eighteen and to get drunk before forty. But men over forty, he tells, to enjoy it and to bring copiously into their banquets the influence of Dionysius, that kind god who restores gaiety to grown men and youth to the old ones, who calms and softens the passions of the soul just as iron is softened by the fire and in his laws he considers convivial drinking to be useful, provided that the group has a leader to ensure that order is maintained, since getting drunk is a good and certain trial of each man's character and, at the same time, has the property of giving older men the idea of enjoying themselves in music and dancing, useful pastimes which they would not dare to engage in when of settled mind. Wine also has the capacity of tempering the soul and giving health to the body. Nevertheless, he liked the following restrictions, partly borrowed from the Carthaginians, that it should be done without on military expeditions, that all statesmen and judges should abstain when about to perform their duties and to deliberate on matters of public concern that the daytime should be avoided. That is owed to other activities, as well as any night when we intend to beget children. They say that the philosopher Stilpo, weighed down by old age, deliberately hastened his death by drinking his wine without water. A similar cause suffocated the failing powers of the aged philosopher Arcasalius, but that was unintentional. Whether the soul of a wise man should be such as to surrender to the power of wine is an old and entertaining question. 
To what inanities are we driven by that good opinion we men have of ourselves? The best governed soul in the world has quite enough to do to stay on her own feet and to keep herself from falling to the ground from her own weakness. Not one in a thousand can stand up calm and straight for one instant in her life. It can even be doubted, given her natural condition, whether she ever can. But if you add constancy as well, then that is her highest perfection. I mean, if nothing should shake it, something which hundreds of events can do, it was no good that great poet Lucretius philosophizing and bracing himself. A love potion drove him insane. Do they think that an apoplexy will not make Socrates lose his wits as much as a porter? Some have forgotten their own names by the force of an illness, and a light wound has struck down the judgment of others. A man can be as wise as he likes. He is still a man. And what is there more frail, more wretched, more a thing of nothing than a man? Wisdom cannot force our natural properties. When he is threatened with a blow, nothing can stop a man closing his eyes or trembling if you set him on the edge of a precipice. Just like a child, nature reserving to herself these signs of her authority, signs slight but unattackable by reason or stoic virtue, in order to teach man that he is mortal, and that he is silly. He becomes livid with fear. He reddens with shame. He bewails an attack of colic paroxysms, if not with a loud cry of despair, at least with a cry which is broken and wheezing. Poets who can make up anything they like dare not relieve their heroes even of the burden of weeping. It suffices that a man should reign in his affections and moderate them, for it is not in his power to suppress them. And my very own Plutarch, so perfect, so outstanding a judge of human actions, when confronted by Brutus and Torquatus, killing their children was led to doubt whether virtue could really get that far, and whether those great men had not in fact been shaken by some passion or other. All actions which exceed the usual limits are open to sinister interpretations, since higher things are no more to our taste than inferior ones. Let us leave aside that other school which makes an express profession of pride. Yet even in that third school, which is reckoned to be the most indulgent of them, all we hear similar boastings from Metrodorus. When an Axarchus, on the orders of Nicorian, tyrant of Cyprus, was put into a stone mortar and beaten to death with blows from an iron pestle, he never ceased to cry, Go on, strike, bash on, you are not pounding an Axarchus, but his casing. When we hear our Christian martyrs shouting out to the tyrant from the midst of their flames, it is well roasted on this side. Chop it off and eat it. It is cooked just right. Now start on the other side. When we hear in Josephus of the boy who was torn to pieces with clawed pincers and bored through by the broad draws of Antiochus, yet who still defied him, crying in a firm, assured voice, Tyrant, you are wasting your time. I am still here, quite comfortable. Where is this pain? Where are those tortures you were threatening me with? Is this all 
you can do. My constancy hurts you more than your cruelty hurts me. You cowardly beggar. It is you who are surrendering. I am growing stronger. Make me lament. Make me give way. Make me surrender if you can. Goad on your henchmen and your hangmen. They have lost heart and can do nothing more. Give them weapons. Egg them on. Then we have to admit that there is some change for the worse in their souls, some frenzy, no matter how holy. When we hear such stoic paradoxes as, I would rather be raging mad than a voluptuary, that is the saying of Antisthenes, when Sextius tells us that he would rather be transfixed by pain than by pleasure, when Epicurus decides to treat gout as though it were tickling him, refuses rest and good health, light-heartedly defies ills, and despising less biting pains, will not condescend to struggle in combat against them, but summons and even wishes for pain which are strong and anguishing and worthy of him. Who does not conclude that those are the cries of a mind which is leaping out of its lodgings? Our soul cannot reach so high while remaining in her own place. She has to leave it and rise upwards and, taking the bit between her teeth, bear her man off, enrapture him away so far that afterwards he is amazed by what he has done. Just as in war, the heat of the combat often makes the valiant soldier take such hazardous steps that they are the first to be struck with astonishment once they have come back to themselves. So, too, the poets are often seized by amazement by their own works and no longer recognize the defiles through which they had passed at a so fine a gallop. In their case, too, it is called frenzy and mania, and just as Plato says that a Sedate man knocks in vain at poetry's door. So too Aristotle says that no outstanding soul is free from a mixture of folly. He is right to call folly any leap, however praiseworthy it might be, which goes beyond our reason and our discourse. All the more so in that wisdom is controlled handling of our soul, carried out on our soul's responsibility, with measure and proportion.